headed into week three in our series on Jonah. And we have seen that this isn't just a story about Jonah. It's about each and every one of us. And Jerry's going to be talking about that right now. Good to see all of you guys here today. Happy 4th of July, and I uh, hope you have a fun time plan. Looks like we're going to get a little rain, but uh, we'll make it. So anyway, so here we go. Just real quick review, uh, get you guys all caught up. We're week three of our series of Jonah. And like I said at the very beginning, you know, when I said we're going to teach on Jonah for a while, a lot of people said, I know that story. Uh, but we're finding out that the story isn't just about Jonah and a, and a big fish. It's a story about me, and it's a story about you. And it begins with this. It said, The word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. And we saw right away that Jonah didn't want to do that, so he's going to run in the opposite direction. He heads to a place called Tarshish. He goes down to the port, finds a ship that's going across the Mediterranean to Tarshish. He pays the fare. He gets on board, and his intent is fully to run away from the Lord. Uh, we saw in our, in our context part of the, the series that the city of Nineveh uh, was about 500 miles um, away from where Jonah lived. Tarshish was about 2,300 miles uh, away from where Jonah lived. It was very, on the very far end of the Mediterranean Sea. And we saw that Jonah could not have chosen a destination any farther uh, from, from Nineveh than, than, uh, than where Tarshish was. Jonah wasn't content simply to sit there and tell God, no, he wasn't going to do it. He's going to run in the opposite direction, which leads us to the question that we've been asking every week during this series. And that is, when God calls, which way do you run? When God speaks to us, we, we run in a direction. We either run to him or run away. So when God calls, which direction do you run? It's interesting to me that Jonah didn't run to someplace familiar. He didn't choose to go on some route that would keep him over, uh, over land. I mean, if you're running for God, if you're running from God, why not go to a place that you know is safe? I mean, why would he choose the most hazard, hazardous uh, route possible? I mean, ships and navigation were very primitive. Uh, storms came up along the Mediterranean Sea on a regular uh, basis. But that's what people do when they run from God. They run to the strangest, most dangerous places, and they make the most nonsensical decisions. I know in my own life, how many times have I stood in front of a mirror and said, Jerry, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? And we watch other people as, we, as they run, and we stand back and we say, what are they, what are they thinking? Now, I've always said, and it's just my little two-point sermon that I throw in two or three times a year, and it's a good thing to remember, is that sin makes you stupid. <laughs> okay? I mean, serious. Think about it. When's the last time you did something really stupid? Okay? It probably involves something you knew you shouldn't have been doing in the first place. But here's the good part. God makes you smart. And uh, Jonah's going to find that out as we go along the story here. So to be fair, if we're Jonah, we can't put him down because we have to appreciate what Jonah knew about Nineveh and what Jonah knew about those people. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. It was one of Israel's most vicious enemies down through their history. Uh, the Assyrian secular history and, and archaeologists tell us that, that the Assyrians had turned cruelty uh, into an art. They had perfected uh, the art of torture. They dismembered and disfigured uh, their enemies. They would skin them alive. They would boil them in all oil. They would go into the palace and they would actually take the bodies of some of their enemies and, and actually frame them and mount them as pieces uh, of art in the king's palace. From Jonah's point of view, these people were not worth saving. Why would he go and warn them that God was going to judge them? Jonah wanted God to judge him. They deserved the judgment of God. And so he didn't want to warn him, so he ran. He ran. He went to the closest seaport, and he paid his passage for the farthest destination that a ship could carry him. And in doing so, he learned a very valuable lesson. And this is where we catch up with where we ended off last week. And that is, you can run from God, but you cannot outrun God. You cannot outrun God. Jonah loaded what possessions he had with him. He put them in the hold of the ship. 
He goes to the bottom of the ship to, to sleep. I think he probably breathed a deep sigh of relief as the coast of Israel disappeared over his shoulder on the horizon. But the voyage was barely underway before a storm came up on the Mediterranean Sea. And the sailors said were very afraid. Now remember, these were seasoned sailors, so they knew this wasn't just a light storm or a sudden sun shower that was going to blow through. They said, this is a bad one. This is the kind where we lose the ship and where we lose our lives. And, and the story last week, they began to throw things overboard to lighten the ship so that it, uh, it would sit a little higher in the water and the waves would not come over the top so fast. Finally, these sailors who were superstitious men, they decided that, that this storm must be some kind of supernatural punishment for someone that's on board. So they cast lots, they drew straws, they flipped a coin, kind of like we'd say. Typically then they would have some kind of coins that they would mark on one side and leave unmarked on the other, and they would use that to try and decipher uh, you know, who to blame or who it was for. And, and the culprit turned out, all of it, turned out to be uh, on Jonah. All of the signs pointed to Jonah. So the men confronted him and they said, who are you? Who's responsible for making all of this trouble for us? Where are you from? What, what people are you? And remember we said last week that for the very first time in the story, Jonah answers. And he answers very plainly. He said, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors then asked, them a que asked him a question that was completely consistent with their worldview. Remember, they were very superstitious people. He's, they said, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? You see, as superstitious people, they believe that the storm was because their gods were angry. If they had bad crops, it was because their gods were angry. If someone was sick, it was because their gods were angry. So they said, if your God is angry at you for running from him, what can we do? To, to end uh, in, in the storm. Uh, but Jonah knew the real reason for the storm. And, and I think maybe at that moment that they asked that question, what can we do? I think it's maybe at that moment that Jonah realized, I'm not going to get out of this. I'm not going to be able to outrun God. But rather than repent right there and ask God to forgive him and to save the ship, Jonah attempts what I call suicide by sailor. <laughs> He said, he said, if you guys will just throw me overboard and, 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 you know, throw me into the sea, he said, it will become calm. He said, I know that it's my fault that the great storm has come upon you. And basically, not a whole lot has changed. He says, I'd rather die than go to Nineveh. I'd rather die than do this thing that God has called me to do. Well, we know these guys didn't want to do that. So they attempted to row themselves to safety from the storm. But, but last week we saw in the narrative that they didn't get any closer to land when they were doing this. And so, so they realized finally they were not going to be able to escape the consequence of Jonah's disobedience. And so you remember they prayed to the God of Israel and they said, you know, don't hold what this man did. Don't blame us for his sin. We don't want to die because of what he did. And they threw Jonah overboard just as he told them to do. And, and in, this, in the narrative we read last week, is so incredible, it said immediately the storm stopped. And again, we have storms, and they come, and they, they blow, and then they kind of lighten up and as they go away. This says immediately. And again, to these seasoned sailors of that captain, that must have been the most amazing thing they had ever seen in their life. And for them, the story ends, all right? The, the storm is gone, but we know that God was not through with Jonah yet. And if you were here last Sunday, I said, right here is where you cue the theme music from Jaws. You know, you start hearing dun, 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 you know, because here Jones is treading water in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So for the sailors, it was over. The story was over. The captain, it was over. They were going to be safe. But for Jonah, the story only just begins. And as he slips beneath the waves, going up and down, he suddenly jolted with the realization that even though he had given up on God, and even though he had run from God, that God had not given up on him. That's probably a good thing for all of us to remember. Is that even in those dark times of our life when we say, that's it, I'm done with this, I don't know if I believe this anymore, I don't know if I can go any further, that God does not give up on us. But the broader context here for all of us, all that's about to happen was that even though Jonah had given up on the people of Nineveh, 
He didn't care about them. He'd rather die than go and, and, and give them God's warning that God had not. And so in one of the most incredible verses in, excuse me, in all of Scripture, it says this, And the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Here's how Jesus told that story in the New Testament. He said that some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said, uh, said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. And Jesus answered and said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks a miraculous sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. I told you at the beginning that a lot of people would say, well, Jerry, you're a relatively intelligent guy, relatively well-read. Do you really believe the story of Jonah? And I told you it really doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. Jesus believed the story of Jonah. And I believe Jesus. And he would know because he was there. And when faced with deciding, you know, between the opinions of self-proclaimed, you know, experts who really haven't read the Bible and come at it with all of their prejudice, if that's on one side and, and the testimony of the Son of God is on the other side as to whether this story happened, I will always go with the one who came back from the dead. That's who I'm always going to go with every time. I have no doubt that the God who simply spoke this universe into existence, everything that we have discovered so far, everything that we haven't discovered yet, that that God would have no problem directing a great fish to go to the exact spot where those sailors threw Jonah into the sea and that he could direct that fish to swallow Jonah whole. I don't have any problem with that. Now, let's continue. When you run from God... There's no telling where you're going to end up. Jonah had no idea this is what was going to happen. And three days and three nights in the pitch black, seaweed-filled belly of a fish is a long time. I don't know for sure, but I don't think it took Jonah three days and three nights to change his mind about going to Nineveh. I really don't. I think that he was bargaining with God for a second chance within the first few minutes. When he realized this is not going well for him. The reason I believe that's the case is because when I was growing up, and this may shock people today, today's culture, but most of you won't. When I was growing up, my dad believed in spanking. And my dad would use a, a leather belt when he would spank me. It, w it was the cutest thing one time before he passed away. We were driving around in a car and he said, I need to apologize to you for something. And I said, what's that? And he said, he said, I really spanked you a lot. <laughs> and I was quiet for a minute. I said, that's okay, Dad. You didn't catch me doing half the stuff I did. <laughs> so we'll call it even, you know. We'll call it even. But, but my dad would, would, he believed in spanking, and he would use a belt. He wouldn't use his hand. And, and, but I would, cons <laughs> I would consistently begin my routine of repentance long before the belt ever hit me. Okay? I mean, as soon as he reached for the belt, I was apologizing. I was negotiating. I was sacrificing small animals, you know. <laughs> I was doing whatever I could to avoid the pain that I knew was coming. And I think that's what happened with Jonah. I think as soon as, you know, as soon as he got thrown overboard, and as soon as that whale, or that, excuse me, Bible says great fish, swallowed him, he said, okay, that's it, I'm sorry, you know, and he began to repent, I'll never do it again, you know, I promise. So I don't think it took Jonah three days to change his mind, I do think it took him three days to learn his lesson, all right? And in the process, Jonah learned something that he would never forget, and that you and I should never forget, and we have Jonah to thank for this. God is very thorough with his discipline. God is very thorough with his discipline. He doesn't play games. Okay? He doesn't play games. Consequently, this was a lesson Jonah wouldn't have to learn twice. This is a lesson that one time does it. But that's not the only thing that he learned in those three days in that fish. 
And we know what it, know some of the things he learned because after this ordeal was over, we, we in the narrative, Jonah sits down and, and he writes out the version of the prayer that he prayed while he was sloshing around in the stomach of this fish. And I absolutely love the opening line of his prayer. He says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. <laughs> I, I bet he did, <laughs> you know, and I bet you and I do. And how many times in our life have, have in the, the, the midst of the trouble, in the depths of the trouble uh, that, that's going on in our lives, how many times have we just cried out to the Lord and just called out to the Lord, distressed many times that we created in our own life and we brought on ourselves when we realize that we cry out to the Lord. Many times it's stress that, that we don't bring on ourselves. It was created by other people. But the same result, we cry out unto the Lord. And here we go with this story. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. And he said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. And he answered me. He answered me. That had to be the best sound <laughs> that Jonah ever had in his life. <laughs> that God answered him in the midst of his trouble. But you and I have to sit back and say, why would God answer the prayer of somebody who turned his back on him? And then ask for help only after hitting bottom. You know, if we were God, we'd like, why are you praying now, Jonah? You know, wh why didn't you pray on the boat? Or why didn't you pray, God, do you really want me? Because I'll go, you know, before he even got on the boat. Wh why didn't you do this? I mean, a prayer of rededication to God doesn't carry a lot of weight in the belly of a fish. I mean, how, more, how much more self-serving could Jonah be? And yet, even when the consequences of Jonah's decision had consumed him and he was barely able to keep going and he didn't know if he was going to take his next, next breath and he had no one to blame but himself, God answered him. God heard his cry for help. And maybe it was then that Jonah realized, and this is so good, and maybe if you don't get anything else today, get this. The purpose of God's discipline was not to pay Jonah back for what he had done. It was to bring him back. It was to bring him back. So many times we have this idea, and, I, and many of you raised this way, and I was raised this way, of a, of a picture of a God who sits up on this throne, and I've shared with this before, you know, he's this old guy in long white beard and, and long white hair and all of this, and over on the side he's got uh, like some lightning bolts, and he's just waiting, you know, for me to do something wrong so he could get me for it. And how many times in my life was I, was I tempted and did I think, you know, if, if something happens, it's because of this and God's going to be angry and God's going to get me for this. And maybe this is what, what, what Jonah was thinking, but now he's learning that the purpose of God's discipline in his life was not to pay him back for what he had done. It was to bring him back. It was to bring him back. The discipline of God is simply an extension of his grace in our lives even if it doesn't feel like it at the time, all right? Jonah goes on in his prayer, and he's speaking to God, and he said, You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. And we know that it was the sailors who physically picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, but we know that it was God who created the circumstance that made throwing him overboard necessary. It was God who brought the storm. It was God who brought the wind and God who brought the waves. The sailors were simply instruments of God's plan to discipline this prophet. And I think it's wise to learn that in the discipline, when Jonah realized it, that he did not resent the Lord for his actions. It's, you know, what I've found in, as a pastor for this many years, and I deal with people that go through things and they realize it was the discipline of God in their lives, is many times when it's over, they look back and they are thankful for the difficult circumstances that they went through. They were thankful because they learned a lesson that they would have never learned at any other time. And one thing that they'll say is while disciplining grace is certainly not pleasant, often because of the benefits of it later and what we learn from it later, it's appreciated later. And, and, and you know, I was thinking through, you know, my wife and I have been married 46 years now. We can think back on time. Man, that was tough, but I'm glad of what we learned as we went through that that we would have never learned without that in our lives. So, while I don't think it took Jonah three days to repent, I do think he repented all three of those days. <laughs> I don't think he slept 
I think it was 24-7, repentance before God. And during that time, it dawned on him that when you run from God, you're running from his grace. He thought he was running just to get away from God, and that would be it. But he found out that when you run from God, you're just running from his grace. And as Jonah later wrote, he said, those who worship false gods turn their back on all of God's mercies. When you turn to run, you're, you're running from God's mercy and from his grace. And Jonah realized it. And, and, and he realized that just like those Ninevites that he hated uh, and that he called pagans, he had opted to serve his own selfish interests. And in doing so, he had forfeited and lost out on a full measure of the grace of God that he's only realizing now. He's only realizing now. And then in another one of those incredible verses in Scripture, when the time of Jonah's divinely appointed discipline was complete, the narrative says, Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. And I cannot imagine what that looked like or smelled like <laughs> after three days. So, here's the deal. You sin every time you go against the will of God. Every time you know what it is that God wants you to do, every time you know from Scripture, from, from godly friends who have counseled you, uh, from, from the leading of the Holy Spirit, every time you know what it is that God wants you to do, and you choose to willfully go in a different direction, every time God says, hey, here's what I want you to do, and you choose to not do it, and every time God says, don't do this, but you choose to do it anyway, Every time you sin, you are choosing your own God. You are choosing yourself as God. And you're running from the one true God. And running from God is the most dangerous activity that you could be involved in. Again, I, I wish I had the time to tell you after 46 years in ministry, <clears throat> not just personal illustrations, but of people that have said to me, Jerry, I know what it is that God wants me to do. But here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And, and, and then to see them come back days, weeks, months, years later. And sometimes never come back. But the ones who come back say, that was the dumbest thing I ever did in my life. I mean, I thought I was running from God to something good. And I thought he was trying to hurt me, but he was only trying to help me. He wasn't trying to pay me back. He's only trying to bring me back. All right? Running from God is the most dangerous activity you can involve yourself in. You can't out, outrun God. You, 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 it's not safe. You never know where you will end up because you've given up control of all of that. But we've seen that God's mercy is massive and he doesn't give up on you and I. And hearing this message, if you're running from God in a key area of your life, just hearing this message in this series means that he is giving you another opportunity to stop and to turn back to him and to quit running from his grace and start running to his grace. And that's good news. And that is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. So I will ask you again, as I've asked you for the last three weeks, which way are you running? Which way are you running? And today, I want you to know that if you are headed in the wrong direction in key areas of your life, that today... Right now, you cannot have to learn some of the hard lessons that Jonah did, but you can learn from the lesson that Jonah went through. And you can say, God, I have been running from you in this area of my life. God, I have been choosing myself as my own God in this area of my life. But I believe that you know better than I do. God, I believe that you are wiser than I am. God, I believe that I am not my own Savior. But I want Jesus to be my Savior. And today, I'm going to stop running, and I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to run to you. And I want you to know something. This week, no matter what you will go through, know that not for one second will you ever be alone. Jonah thought <laughs> in his mind of minds that he could run from the presence of God. And he found out the hard way that God's the worst person in the world to play hide and seek with. All right? You have never in your life, no matter how far you ran, no matter how far you ran, 
or how fast you ran, you have never not been in the presence of God. Never not been. And this is a God in heaven who invites you to call him Father. And he shows his love for you by offering his grace through the gift of his Son, Jesus. So I'm going to ask one more time today. When God calls in areas of your life that only you and him know, which way do you run? I believe God calls people to salvation. I believe he calls people to repentance. I believe he calls people to reconciliation. I believe he calls people to service. And I don't know how he's calling you. But when he calls, which way do you run? And since I don't know your specific instance, I do know one thing I can say for all of us. And that is the wisest thing that you will ever do is to run to the mercy, to run to the peace, and to run to the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. Father, we're thankful for this incredible story that, that, that a culture that believes all kind of crazy things sits back and says, oh, we can't believe that story. God, we believe it. We believe it because we trust in you. We trust in our Savior who said this story is true. And more important, we believe it because we know that it's not just about Jonah. But it's about us. It's about us. This is, this, this is our story. And God, we, we, we've learned that we can't outrun you. We've learned that your grace is, ma is massive. God, we've learned today that when we run, the only thing we're running from is not you, but we're running from your grace and your love and your forgiveness. So, Father, we ask today, I ask as pastor of this church for each person that's here, that we would take a moment today this week, tonight, and just check things out with God and say, God, are there any areas of my life where I'm moving away from you? Because, God, that would be the most unwise thing I could do. God, help me to move towards you. Father, we're thankful today for Jesus and for all that he's done for us, for his death on the cross, for his resurrection, uh, for the way that he lives within us and his spirit lives within us. And, Father, we're thankful for Jesus today, and we pray this in his name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, a name above every other name and Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show song we could ever sing and worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever say, 
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Love to those around me now. 